Everybody, welcome to the Institute for Government. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe Owen. I'm Programme Director on the Institute for Government's Brexit Programme. We are very pleased to welcome you here this morning for this event on the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. Uh, I don't think it'll be a surprise to any of you that the bill is now, I think, formally on ice, possibly awaiting a move to the deep freeze if we go for a general election. But this extra time gives us a little bit more space than uh, was otherwise provided for by the government's programme motion to get into the detail, think about what is in the bill, why it's important, and what some of the potential challenges will be for the government in getting it through. So we have a wonderful panel to help us do that. On my far right, we've got Raoul Ruparel, who was uh, special advisor to Theresa May on Europe. Uh, before that, special advisor at Dexu, and before that, uh, director at Open Europe. On my immediate right, we have Raphael Hogarth, who's an associate at the Institute for Government. He's also a visiting lecturer at City Law Firm. City Law School. School. Sorry, not firm. Uh, and, not yet, anyway. Um, and also a writer at The Times. And on my left, we have Maddie Tim and Jack, senior researcher at the Institute for Government. Uh, and the brains behind our Parliament and Brexit work. So we've got about half an hour discussion with the panel, then open up to discussions from the floor. Uh, for those on the live stream, you can follow along and tweet along using hashtag IFGBrexit, um, and there will be plenty of time for you guys to fire questions after we've had our chat. So, to start, I'm gonna go to Raphael, who, um, weirdly started to think about the WAB over two years ago. Um, and so, Raphael, it would be helpful if you gave us a bit of background. So what is this bill? Where did it come from? And why is it important? So the reason that we started thinking about the WAB over two years ago, in fact, in uh, about October 2017, was that when the government first brought forward the uh, EU withdrawal bill, it proposed that it would in the end, once it had a deal, implement that deal in domestic law using secondary legislation, using a statutory instrument. Uh, and we said, no, that's a terrible idea, because if you do that, then the implementing legislation won't get enough scrutiny. So eventually, the government said, OK, we'll bring forward a piece of legislation, and that's uh, what we now see as the withdrawal agreement bill. But it now looks like that also might not get enough scrutiny. So why, why is a bill needed to implement the agreement? It's at this point needed for two reasons. First of all, you need legislation to implement any international agreement with consequences for domestic law. Because when the UK signs an international treaty, uh, that treaty doesn't automatically get incorporated into our own law. Parliament is sovereign. Parliament has to legislate to do that. Uh, and there's a special extra requirement in this case because of Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. Uh, which says that the government actually isn't allowed to ratify that agreement until Parliament has passed legislation containing provision to implement it. So uh, legislation is always required to make a treaty work, and in this case, it's also required to make the treaty. So what does the bill actually do? Well, I sort of see it in two buckets. The first is the proper implementation stuff provisions of the bill that give effect to provisions of the negotiated withdrawal agreement. So there's provisions on transition, uh, where the bill says that it's going to keep in force parts of the European Communities Act 1972 for the duration of the transition period, make sure EU law stays on our statute book for that period. There are provisions on citizens' rights to make sure that EU citizens can enforce their rights before uh, domestic courts uh, and also to set up a new independent monitoring authority essentially to keep tabs on the Home Office and other bits of government to make sure that it's uh, not do anything, doing anything naughty in respect of EU citizens. Uh, and that part of the bill at the moment is, uh, I think it's fair to say, pretty vague. Lots of powers for ministers to fill in the gaps later. Uh, it makes provision for the divorce bill by giving ministers powers to make payments to the EU uh, under the financial settlement and the withdrawal agreement. Uh, interestingly, and I think quite unexpectedly, those powers don't last very long. So the bill only gives them powers up until, I think, uh, March 2021, so up until just after the end of the current <coughs> transition period as planned, 
Uh, and from that period on, uh, th the plan is that the government would have to raise money for those payments in the normal way by asking Parliament money for money uh, every year. Uh, the bill implements the protocol on Northern Ireland as well, uh, but not in a great deal of detail. The bit on the protocol on Northern Ireland is basically one big power saying ministers can do this by making regulations later. Uh, and finally, on the implementation <coughs> stuff, uh, the bill makes provision for the status of the agreement and of EU law on the UK statute book after Brexit. So it gives the withdrawal agreement and any EU law incorporated by the withdrawal agreement supremacy over UK law in just the same way that EU law has supremacy over UK law while we're in the EU. So that's the sort of techie stuff that the bill does to implement the agreement. And then there's a second bucket of things that the bill does, which it doesn't have to do to implement the agreement, um, but that sort of go with that suite of things. So it provides for parliamentary oversight of the process for extending the, tra the transition period, provides for parliamentary oversight of negotiations on the future relationship, uh, contains some provisions on workers' rights, putting ministers under, under obligations to make statements to the House about whether legislation rose back on EU workers' rights or not, uh, provides for some mechanisms for Parliament to scrutinise any new EU laws that come into force during transition and thus that the UK would be bound by but without having a say on in the EU institutions. Uh, and it also makes provision for the sort of for, for, for this treaty to come into force by disapplying other bits of legislation that impose extra requirements like a meaningful vote uh, or, or laying the treaty before Parliament 21 days before you want to ratify and makes provision for uh, the ratification of the next treaty, the future, future relationship uh, treaty uh, saying that Parliament will have to have a vote on that. So that is in, in broad outline. A whistle stop does. tour of the well. Yeah. Um, Raoul, you Theresa May came very close to publishing this thing, um, so close that she then ended up leaving Downing Street not very long afterwards. Um, <coughs> what, when you looked through what was published, was there anything that struck you as different? How did this publication differ to the one that you guys were going to put out uh, in March time? So I think a lot of it is very similar. So I think uh, Raphael's right in terms of the very broad powers it takes. I think in many cases, you know, our assessment was that there's not a whole uh, number of ways you can do this, really, because the implementing legislation on some of these things needs to be incredibly detailed, and so it is better suited to secondary legislation. But you're right that those are some very broad powers, and I think in particular cases there are questions how they should be deployed, how they should be scrutinised, and I think that's the type of thing Parliament is looking to take more time to look at. The bits that struck me as being different, um, or sort of uh, di diverging from the approach we took, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol in particular um, was an interesting one, not because it is a single broad power, which it is. Um, actually, I tend to think, again, there's not many other ways you could do that, particularly given this draft of the Northern Ireland Protocol leaves a lot of details to be fleshed out down the line, so you simply have to wait and see exactly what the detail is going to be. But because it removed a lot of the um, guarantees that the previous government had given to the DUP about unfettered access to the GB market, uh, about having a say on any new rules that are incorporated into the backstop, um, which the Joint Committee has to approve. You know, the previous government in January we published a paper setting out how we would involve Stormont and the Northern Ireland institutions in that process. That has not been included. So there are guarantees for the DUP in your version that didn't yeah. make it through to the and, and even the early guarantees, not the, not the last ditch guarantees we gave in, in March and, and uh, that final final um, approach that uh, the, the Prime Minister at the time set out, but the ones we gave in January as well were not included. So I think that's interesting and I guess indicative of the distance that has been put between the Conservative Party and DUP on this, on this point. There are a few other interesting differences. One is, uh, as Raphael flagged on the financial settlement, the sort of time limit, which is not really a time limit. Uh, you know, it's a bit arbitrary. It sort of sets out that this power ends in uh, March 21, but it can be extended by regulation, so by, by a statutory instrument, uh, but also Parliament can go back to the normal way of, of funding a requirement. So it in no way avoids paying the financial settlement, but it it just sort of means the way that it is paid could change. So this seems like it may be something there just to sort of issue a concern and show to the backbenchers, yes, we don't love this, but um, you know, it's something we have to do. Uh, in terms of some of the other differences, it does set out you know, protection of workers' rights. Again, it doesn't go as far as, as the, government, the previous government was looking to go in terms of um, you know, protecting those workers' rights 
um, and um, you know the offer that was made in the cross-party talks. If you look at uh, also the what's in the, what I guess is known as the Snell and Andy clause, so the um, uh, oversight of the future negotiations, uh, it is inserted quite interestingly that any any sort of mandate handed down by Parliament has to be in line with the political declaration. Now that wasn't something we had envisaged, partly because we didn't think it would get through, um, and I, I, I expect it won't get through this time. So if when the bill, when and if the bill does come back to be looked at by Parliament, I expect that bit to be changed. So th those are some of the key changes. But on the whole, I think the, the broad approach is right, and I think. You know, there is, there is a question about these broad powers, and, and everyone knows they're not ideal, but I think, to be fair to the government, we spent a lot of time looking at this, and even when we had more time, the approach would have been very similar in general. Um, so I think the question is not necessarily about whether those broad powers should be in there, but it's how they're scrutinised, how they're deployed, and what oversight Parliament has. And I think those are the right questions for Parliament to be asking with the time they've, they've now got. So coming to the time that Parliament has now got, um, Maddie, where are we at after yesterday. Do you want to give us a quick overview of what happened and what are the options for what might come next? Yeah, sure. An easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, what happened last night is that MPs did pass second reading of the withdrawal agreement bill. So there was a majority of 30. I think it was a larger majority than quite a lot of people were expecting. Um, I think it's important to say in terms of this majority, I think we cannot read it as a straight across majority for the deal itself. It was a majority from some MPs supported second reading of the bill to then have an opportunity to amend it. And, you know, we can have a conversation about what amendments might be coming down and they're already been laid, but also we are expecting to, be, to see. So, there, but, there, but it still is, it was important. There, there is a majority for progressing with this legislation and scrutinising what the government plans to do in terms of implementing the deal. Obviously, what also happened was MPs rejected passing the programme motion. And the programme motion would have essentially... Uh, forced the Commons to rush through scrutiny of this bill so that they'd have finished with all stages of the Commons by Thursday so it could go over to the Lords. And the plan was to try and get to a position where they could pass this legislation before the 31st of October, so that could be the, the date that the UK um, left the EU. Now, in terms of options going forward, um, Boris Johnson's response last night was to say, well, we now need to wait and see what the EU is going to do, what they're going to do in terms of the, the request that, he, that Parliament, as he said, um, made for an extension. Uh, I think the, his sort of two options, um, while sort of in terms of what happens when, when the next steps, I think will depend on what the EU does say. So last night, Tusk tweeted out, and a lot of people re responded by thinking that the EU was willing to then accept <coughs> the extension request that Parliament made until the 31st of January. But this morning, there's a, there's a bit more uncertainty, and I think it, it will all depend on what the EU says. So if they come back saying, actually, they'd either offer a sort of two-stage extension where the UK could leave sooner if they pass the withdrawal agreement bill or until the 31st of January, then we might see the government want to res return to passing the withdrawal agreement bill. But if they say that they want something longer, then that it, we can imagine the government might be more tempted to go for a general election. Um, and I think that when, in terms of the sort of timetable for passage of the withdrawal agreement bill, um, Jeremy Corbyn did respond last night saying, look, we are willing to talk with the government and agree a sort of sensible timetable for passage. Um, and again, if the EU comes out with a shorter extension, we can imagine the government and, and the opposition will be forced to discuss that and try and agree that. Um, it's worth saying that even if Boris Johnson does want an early election, then he does still need to, under the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, get a two-thirds majority in the House of Commons in favour of an early election motion. Um, and again, a lot will come down to what opposition parties decide to do with that. Um, there have been some discussion of ways around that for the government. They could, for example, table a vote of no confidence in their own government um, to seek a simple majority there. And if they sort of abstained on that vote, um, then, uh, then the vote of no confidence would pass. Um, or they could try and pass a sort of one-line bill or a sort of short bill to say that they want to hold an early election on a specific date, sort of notwithstanding the terms of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. But that, again, would need a simple majority to pass. Um, and would be open to amendment in the Commons and the Lords, so it's not straightforward. So, to be honest, it feels like at this stage there's still so much could happen, but it is worth saying, you know, that the government hasn't pulled the withdrawal agreement bill. As Joe said, it is on ice, um, and, and we really might see it come back much sooner than some people expect. Well, if you were still in number 10, and you have, there's basically this choice between trying to muddle through and get the bill over the line now, or to go for an election, what would you be? What are the things that you would be weighing up in trying to come to a decision on that? So for me, it comes down to when the Conservatives think they have the best chance of winning an election. 
Um, so it's, it's basically, do you think going to an election, uh, having left, having got through the bill, um, getting out of the EU, uh, and then going to an election where the Brexit party will probably see a decrease in support because we've already left and where a second referendum or revoke is no longer on the table because we will have left. I think you can make an argument that's quite a strong position for the Conservatives to go to an election uh, as all the other main parties have to readjust their manifestos and the Conservatives are then in a good position of saying we actually delivered. Uh, on the other hand, you could make the argument that going to an election before we've left is also quite an attractive prospect because at that point you have... Um, you know, you have the la Labour position being second referendum, which is alienating some of their heartlands, and that is a particular part of the current Conservative government strategy to eat into those Labour heartlands. So it partly depends on your election strategy and the coalition you're trying to build in terms of support. Do they want to go back, and do they believe they can go back to the type of uh, electoral coalition that, that supported the, the Tories in 2015? Or do they want to try this new strategy of eating in um, to Labour heartlands and getting those leave votes, which is sort of what we tried in 2017 with, with not so much success. Um, but uh, I think that is, that is going to be a big part of the calculation. And that then filters through into what you're willing to accept in terms of the bill. You know, if you really just want to get the bill through, get out and then have the election, you might be willing to wear some amendments, but then try to undo them when you have the majority. So I think for me now, I'd be saying this comes down to what the electoral calculation is. And, and obviously that then comes down to a lot of what, you know, the polling and focus groups are saying, and it's all quite fluid at the moment. So it is a, it's a very finely balanced calculation. And if you were to go for the, the bill option, and to say, right, we'll just try and muddle through and get this piece of legislation over the line and then go for an election. How long do you actually think you would need to give if it came back round to conversations about what is the right amount of time that we need to give in order to pass the withdrawal agreement bill? And what are some of the kind of approaches that you would need to take in kind of dealing with amendments? Like you said, you might have to wear a few uncomfortable ones. Well, look, I mean, it's when we were looking at this back in, uh, back in the day, we were thinking you need quite a few weeks for each house. Now, I'm not sure it would quite go that far. We saw some briefing yesterday. The Labour Whips said they were, would have been willing to agree to seven or nine days, I presume, just for the Commons. So I think you're probably looking at giving seven, seven to a week or ten days in the Commons and probably similar in the Lords. So you're looking two or three weeks to try and get this, get this through both houses, uh, maybe a few days for ping pong. I think that would be a reasonable timetable and would be quite hard for... Um, for anyone to disagree with, particularly if you're allocating long sitting hours uh, and there isn't really much else going on in Parliament. Obviously, we still have the issue of the Queen's Speech knocking around, but basically, you know, you're allocating all the time, time to that. I think that would probably be quite hard for Labour uh, and the other sides uh, to reject. In terms of the amendments, I think you're then looking at what are the truly wrecking amendments and the truly ones you cannot live with. And I think the only one that really is, is around that, that fits that bill is the second referendum. I think given the votes we saw last night, it's hard to imagine there being a majority for a second referendum in the House now. You know, if you look at the people, the MPs that supported second reading, I think most of those, that sort of coalition of numbers would hold up against the second referendum. Um, and then in terms of the other amendments, the big one is the customs union. And I think that really is a question of whether the government believes it can, it can pass the bill with a customs union amendment while holding the narrative and saying, look, we're accepting this, but we're going to go to an election to fight on this issue, fight on what the future relationship should be and try and win a mandate to change that. Um, it will cause problems with the ERG and, and the hardliners. They may, they may not want to see a bill pass that has a customs union in it, but again, it's a calculation for them. I mean, a lot of them will be under pressure from the Brexit party in their seats. And so actually getting Brexit done and being able to use that as an election might be an attractive prospect for them in terms of the, the electoral calculation. And then all the other amendments, I think, in the end, you know, about the government has already basically conceded a lot of them in terms of accepting a vote on extending the, the transition period, um, workers' rights, uh, and oversight of the future negotiations. I think that the, these basic principles have been accepted. It's about the exact wording, and there will be some tweaks. But, but on the whole, I think those won't be huge flashpoints. Raphael, both in terms of kind of amendments, but also just what is in the bill already, and um, you touched on some of it earlier around the financial settlement. Uh, and the powers there kind of sunsetting in 2021. I mean, are there, is there a risk that the passage of the bill, whether through amendment or just what's in it and what is acceptable now, stalls up problems for the government further down the line, perhaps domestically, but also from an EU perspective? Yeah, I, I think there are sort of three sorts of problem that could be generated by uh, Parliament not properly doing its job over the bill or scrutinising the bill. The, the first of which is the UK's compliance with its international obligations. So this is a bill to give effect to treaty obligations, which are international law obligations. 
Um, and that means that what's in the bill and what's in the treaty have to match. Uh, and I think that's true particularly over the financial settlement, as you say, where EU partners will be watching very closely to make sure that there's <coughs> sufficient domestic legislative provision that they can be confident that the UK is always going to pay the bill. Uh, also over citizens' rights, uh, making sure that uh, there's sufficient provision there, especially when a lot of the provisions in the bill at the moment leave a lot open in terms of powers, uh, and in particular on the protocol on, on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, so, so, so that's one thing, making sure that the bill doesn't put us in a position where we might be breaking international law, and that, that matters for two reasons. Breaking international <coughs> law matters, firstly, because it's very long-standing UK policy that the UK is a good international citizen, a defender of the rule of international law, and it enforces that on other countries worldwide, saying, we abide by international law, you had better do so as well, and that's a sort of important part of UK foreign policy. Uh, but also, just from a more kind of cynical, uh, mercantile perspective, if the UK is about to go on an international charm offensive, trying to sign uh, a load of new trade agreements and other agreements with potential partners, then it needs to be considered a credible partner. Uh, and if you mess up the domestic implementing uh, legislation such that you can't give effect to your obligations, you're not a credible partner. Uh, so that's sort of problem type number one. Problem type number two, I guess, is just certainty and making sure the statute book works properly. Um, and this is the stuff where sort of time for scrutiny really matters because uh, even if MPs have, say, two weeks to come over the detail of the bill, uh, what you really need is to make sure that committees, committee clerks, committee experts, some of whom I can see here today, and also the wider kind of expert community, lawyers and policy experts, have time to make sure that there are no legislative <coughs> gaps. Um, and those aren't just sort of techie worries that, uh, that lawyers like to get all het up about but don't make any difference to people in the real world. They make an enormous difference to people in the real world uh, because of the fact that if you're a business trying to make a decision or you know, do a deal, then you need to know what rules you're regulated by, what the scope of those rules is, which rules take precedence over which other rules. Uh, and really, Parliament doesn't always get that right. You know, the European Community Act 1972, which was the equivalent piece of uh, legislation for the EU treaties was still being litigated in respect of the supremacy of EU law 20 years later because people were not exactly sure what those provisions meant, what Parliament had intended. So it, you know, it really matters getting that right to make sure people aren't having to spend a huge amount of money for years on legal advice that still doesn't give them a firm answer about what they can and can't do. Um, and, and then I suppose the final potential type of worry that you can store up if you don't do this properly um, is you can just deepen the animosity between government and parliament. Uh, it, you know, as, as I mentioned, as Rule mentioned, the government does attempt to take a lot of powers in the bill, and at this point it's difficult to work out, you know, before we've had a really forensic close look at it, uh, whether those powers are absolutely reasonable, uh, only as wide as they need to be, with proper scrutiny provisions, only as numerous as they need to be, uh, or whether these are unnecessarily extensive uh, unnecessarily broad and without proper scrutiny provisions. And if they are the latter, uh, then in a couple of years down the line, the government might be trying to change the law by making regulations. The Parliament's saying, hang on a minute, those are policy changes that you're not letting us scrutinise, uh, and that's not good government, and when it comes to it, not very good politics either. And that was the big source of battle, basically, on the EU Withdrawal Act, the so-called Great Repeal Bill, right, all around the EU, sort of putting safeguards in around these powers. Absolutely. You know, the, the development of a sifting uh, system in Parliament to make sure that uh, where the government was trying to use powers under the EU Withdrawal Act, they were going an, an, in, in such a way as to, uh, in, in such a way that Parliament would essentially want to scrutinise the use of those powers, uh, then MPs would have an opportunity to look at and potentially debate what was done. And, and you know, there are problems with, this, with the sifting system that was developed, the EU Withdrawal Act, which I'm sure Maddie can talk about. Uh, but but I suspect Parliament is going to want to move pretty quickly uh, in order to put something, some scrutiny provisions uh, in place for the use of these powers. And, and, and on that head, what I would say is, if, if, if the timetable that Raoul outlines is, is something like what we're going to get a few weeks, then committees need to start moving really fast. Uh, 
they need to open their inquiries now, they need to work out what clauses they're focusing on now, start taking evidence now, um, because we might be in a position where by the time uh, MPs and experts get round to doing these tweaks, working out these problems, we're back to the land of the government saying, yeah, but we need to get out, do or die in a couple of days' time, we don't have time for any of this, and, and, and we mustn't get back there just because people were too slow off the mark. So Raphael's touched on a bit of mm -hmm. the kind of the scrutiny stuff, which was the big battle around the programme motion, was giving more time for scrutiny. Do you want to touch on some of the things that Parliament would want to do, and also what the prospects for the House of Lords might be? Because that's the one thing we haven't really talked about, is how the Lords might get their teeth into this. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think uh, just sort of on, on the scrutiny point, it is worth saying that the EU Withdrawal Act, which went through, sort of was passed last year, um, that was sort of the government's flagship um, bill, it, it took about a year to go through both houses, and the House of Commons and the House of Lords collectively spent 273 hours scrutinising that piece of legislation. And the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, if you've got a few weeks, even if you have longer sitting hours, you're not going to get anywhere close to that. And there are, you know, there were big raw powers, as Raphael said, in, in that piece of legislation that were controversial. And we're seeing the same again in, in the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. And it's not quite clear whether um, the same sort of uh, scrutiny mechanisms will, will apply to the, the powers under the Withdrawal Agreement Bill. So that, that is a concern. And as Raphael said, that there is something both about committees in the House of Commons and the House of Lords being able to open inquiries, take evidence from experts, but also around sort of civil society groups being able to uh, scrutinise the legislation and raise their own concerns, as, as normally happens when legislation goes through um, Parliament. So, you know, I, again, one of the things I don't think has been mentioned yet is the fact that it's establishing the independent monitoring authority. That's a whole new public body that is there to oversee um, the sort of implementation of the citizens' rights aspect of the withdrawal agreement. And, and if, if we're rushing this through, there's not much time to look at how that body will work and whether it does have sufficient independence from, from government. So that, that is part of the reason why it really matters. And I think the House of Lords is really interesting because even if the, the opposition and government agree that maybe seven or eight days in the Commons is sufficient, um, the government doesn't sort of control the parliamentary agenda and the Lords in quite the same way. Um, they do often agree sort of timetabling for legislation, but their government doesn't have a majority in the House of Lords. And if they end up trying to resort to something like a business motion, which is what the Lords end up passing in September to be able to rush the Ben Act through, um, the government doesn't have a majority there. So it might be much harder to get the House of Lords to agree to, to rush this legislation through. I mean, having said that, it is important to say that the Lords do recognise them, themselves as sort of a second chamber, and, and if the Commons have shown themselves willing to pass this legislation quickly to allow Brexit to happen, the Lords may not necessarily stand in their way. But I think that particularly some of the aspects that Raphael just outlined, that peers in particular are going to be quite concerned by, and, and they definitely <coughs> won't want to rush it through. Um, and, and I think it's not just about having... So we've done a bit of work. I mean, Raphael actually, you know, April 2018 looked at the length of time it took for previous legislation relating to EU treaties to go through um, Parliament. And, you know, there's sort of one chart that says the Lisbon Treaty, for example, I think it took 25, 26 sitting days. But if you actually look at how long it took in terms of time, it was close to 200 days, because actually it was about having time between each stage of the bill's progress to reflect on what happened and to, again, assess whether amendments have gone down, how those work, it gives time for committees to report. Um, so even if you've got sort of more time available, um, the, the sort of process of rushing it through does limit, um, as Raphael said, external experts and committees' abilities to scrutinise what is in the bill um, and to ensure that also the amendments that they table um, will make sense and also not store up problems later down the line. So I think it will be interesting to see. I'm, I'm not necessarily predicting a complete bum fight in the House of Lords over this because I think if the Commons are willing to rush it through, then Lords may agree to do the same. But at the same time, uh, I, do, I do think there are going to be some serious concerns. And, and it isn't the way that government should be passing such a constitutionally significant piece of legislation. I think some people have said, well, look, this withdrawal agreement, the majority of it, apart from the Northern Ireland Protocol, is basically the same as the withdrawal agreement that Theresa May negotiated, which we've seen since last November. But we never saw the bill that was going to implement this agreement. So we never knew quite how the government was planning to do that. And maybe if May had ended up, uh, Theresa May had ended up publishing the withdrawal agreement back in May, then that would be a sort of better argument to say, OK, fine, we've seen most of it, we can, we can move forward with it. But we haven't. And, and so, you know, it was published on Monday. And the idea that Parliament <coughs> was going to pass it all by next Thursday um, was, yeah, it was sort of incredible, really, because you just have no idea what, what that might, the problems that might store up, as Raphael has already outlined. So we're, we're talking about the, 
bill and the need for scrutiny of the bill, but MPs have also not really had that much time with the deal, right, to understand what that means. I mean, Raul, as someone who uh, is credited with coming up with one of the ideas that potentially broke the deadlock around uh, the Irish uh, protocol, I mean, do you think it's clear that people understand what is in the deal and how that would work? I mean, can we understand how it's worked, given how much has been kicked into the next phase? Um, no, look, I think it's, it's a fair point. There is a lot of misunderstanding about the deal, I think, both within government and within the House of Parliament generally. I mean, I remember when, you know, we got the deal um, and we organised a series of briefings for MPs, from people who had helped negotiate the deal, such as myself and some of the officials and uh, some of the other senior advisors, and we went to Parliament and hired a number of rooms and tried to brief the MPs, and probably about six of them turned up. Um, because they were all out doing media commenting on the, on the deal, <laughs> saying what they thought of it. Um, so, look, this isn't, isn't just a matter of time, it's a matter of the approach MPs take to it and their willingness to engage with the deal and the detail. And, uh, you know, a lot of them have made up their minds already which way they're going to go on it, regardless of, of the detail and because of more political calculations. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in, and, and maybe we all wish it was different, but, but that's the way it is at the moment. So, Yes, I think there is misunderstanding and people do need to get into more detail, but I'm not sure that's going to change the fundamentals of how this vote goes and things. But, uh, you know, in an ideal world, we would have more time to scrutinise the deal and, and scrutinise the bill. Um, I think that's, that's fair. And the points that have been raised here about the, the sort of rushing through and the broad nature of the powers and, and all that are very true. I mean, a couple of points I would, I would make just sort of having served in government to sort of make the sort of counter-government view, I guess, is, yeah. you know, these broad powers are not unchecked. You know, obviously, they don't just give... Often people talk about Henry VIII powers as if it's an executive power for the government. Well, it, it allows them to do secondary legislation. So there is still scrutiny of the secondary legislation. You know, particularly if it's affirmative leg secondary legislation, that can be voted on and rejected, and the government would then have to come back with a different approach. There is a, a process built in. It's not just as if, you know, you give these powers and they wield them um, unchecked. But I think certainly it's right that, that you know, there is, there is a question about uh, right for Parliament to examine how broad they are and, and what level of scrutiny is applied down the line. So I'm going to open up to questions from the floor. We have a couple of roving mics. Um, so, Hayden, do you want to? Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, every let us know who you are. I will do. Thank yes, you. I'm Martin Lejeune, and I work for a company called uh, CTF Partners, which is a consultancy. Um, yes, compliments to the panel. I'm much better informed at the end of this than... Uh, at the start, but uh, one aspect of which I uh, wanted to challenge, and that is, I think it was ad addressed by Raoul, and that is, for 90% of members of Parliament in Commons, mm -hmm. that is, uh, scrutiny of scrutiny of bills like this is is a desirable, but actually not a real thing. Um, they will not engage with the detail of the legislation. In fact, many members of Parliament don't understand parliamentary drafting legislative language. Uh, and I wonder if you're, uh, to pick up Maddie's point, whether you all agree that in, in the passage of this legislation, if it ever gets through, the Lords is going to be vastly more important as a mechanism of improving its, uh, def its deficiencies than the Commons uh, ever will be. Hi, uh, um, my name is Emilio from Politico. Um, I've got a couple of questions from, for Raoul. Um, firstly, is the DUP position kind of inherently paradoxical? Is it possible at all to uh, be pro-Brexit the way they are, want to leave the customs union, etc., but still end up with a deal that they're happy with that doesn't entail checks across the RSC? Um, and then secondly, from your experience, um, do you have a view on kind of why Boris Johnson managed to get to this point and Theresa May didn't? Is it something to do with timing or is it something to do with people argue gender, etc.? Uh, a sort of sex in an issue. Is there anything along those lines? And then um, a question for um, Maddy. Um, is there any point in having a general election? Uh, sorry, is there, is there any point in trying to push the bill through without having a general election? Uh, you know, we see the problems that they have with the programme motion, etc. Surely there's just going to be so many hurdles to get through. People are going to frustrate as much as they can, especially knowing that no deal is probably off the table because the EU will <coughs> go for delays. Might as well the government just go for an election. Is that not the best option? So, Raul, there were a few in there for you, um, so I will let you kick off with your questions about is there a deal the DUP would ever vote for, uh, and why has Johnson got this far? So I think, look, there is, there is a bit of a paradox and, te and, and quite a lot of tension in the DUP position, that's very true, and we've seen it throughout, and having spent a lot of time talking to them throughout the negotiations, there certainly is a challenge. Um, 
it, look, you can question whether a version of the previous deal with some of the consent process attached, for example, might actually have been you know, quite close to what the DEP would have accepted um, and might have been more, more um, applicable to them, but we'll never really know. Um, and you know, I think, as is their nature, they, they don't reveal much and they don't pin themselves down to a public position until the very last moment. So it's always hard to know what their absolute red line is. Uh, I think, but I think what we've seen is that you know, they were willing to accept some of the regulatory barriers across East, uh, east West, um, across the Irish Sea, so similar to what was in the previous deal, but the custom step was one too far, even with the consent process attached. So, so I, I, do, I do still think that maybe there might have been a version um, of uh, the previous, previous Northern Ireland Protocol, but with more democratic consent built in, that, that could have been more acceptable to them, but again, we'll never know. In terms of um, why Boris was able to get this far and, and uh, Theresa May wasn't, I mean, given I worked for Theresa May and obviously uh, sort of put forward some of these ideas, people have questioned why I didn't do that when I worked for her. Um, but I think, I think look, the reason, the reason why we didn't get to this kind of approach under, under the previous government was there are two real reasons that I see. One is the DEP actually weren't willing to give the government at that time as much rope. Um, now they may regret that, and um, you know that's that's something that people should obviously take up with them. But um, I, you know, I, I think at the time we just felt we couldn't go for this kind of approach because it immediately would have been um, killed by the DEP and, and wouldn't have got off the ground. I think it's also when you look at the customs approach, it's very reliant on this hybrid customs system. Now, under the previous government, obviously they were, you know, we were still looking at that as the full future relationship. And I think it's quite hard to move from that being UK-wide to being Northern Ireland-specific when you still want that for the future relationship because the two don't really fit together and it's not quite compatible. So I think once that was removed as a future relationship, it then opened up a different door in terms of how it might be applied in Northern Ireland specifically. So I think those, those for me, are the two key changes as to why we didn't, we didn't end up here in the previous government. Just on the, uh, on the point about the Lords, I think, I think it's a valid point, and, and generally I think that's true of a lot of legislation, that the Lords do the very technical work and the technical amendments, and, and that's often why they indeed take, you know, on, as a rule of thumb, double the time the Commons takes um, to, to scrutinise legislation. So I'm sure um, that will be, I think that will be even more true for this bit of legislation, because I think, as we discussed, the flashpoints are going to be amendments on customs union, second referendum, things like that in the Commons. And so I think even more than usual, the technical stuff will get pushed to the side. So there is going to be a big job for the Lords um, to try and look at some of this stuff in, in um, minute detail. I think the question will be how much they're willing to put in terms of amendments and then what that means for ping pong and how much the Commons is willing to wear. It's a difficult balance to strike. I think on the timing, one thing I would say as well, just, you know, the, about the timetable of the Lords, Maddie's absolutely right. I think when we looked at it, we were of the view that any timetable in session had to be, had to be both houses. So you should have the uh, usual channels of both houses in the Spain place having that negotiation. I don't think there's much point doing a negotiation for one house and not the other. But I'll just very quickly to come back on the question around the border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain and the kind of um, the approach that's taken now. I mean, is there any chance that that will be ready by the end of December 2020, the point at which it needs to be in place? Um, <laughs> it's a tricky question. Uh, look, I think it's going to be very ambitious. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, you know, it is, it is um, a, a very, you know, there are a lot of things that have to be constructed in terms of, you know, negoti first of all, negotiating the detail of how it's going to work. As yeah. we've discussed, the protocol leaves a lot of that open. Uh, and then allowing businesses time to respond and implement that and then implementing it on the ground in terms of any, uh, you know, infrastructure that's needed at the customs, customs post. You know, you have to create um, a, a BIP for the agri-food, which means all of the agri-food things can be checked. And you also have to then create the surveillance systems to monitor things on the market for the regulatory goods checks and things like that. So that is going to take some time. To be fair, I think you know this was true though of the previous version of the protocol. I think setting up the infrastructure even under that one would have taken quite a bit of time. And there were very valid questions about whether that could have been done by the end of 2020. So I'm not sure this is a new problem, but I think it is a legitimate question to ask. Uh, and you know, I think both sides have to engage with it as can this realistically be up and running uh, by that point? And if it's not, what are the consequences? Uh, now, obviously, if it isn't, um, I think the EU will have some serious concerns about whether its single market and its customs union is being properly protected and enforced. But obviously, from the UK point of view, you would think the concerns might be less, and particularly in Northern Ireland, the concerns would be, would be less. Um, looking at the text of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol, the levels of enforcement that the EU have are, you know, 
uh, you wonder what what route they can take. Obviously, they can end up resorting to fining the UK for not adhering to the to the agreement. Um, but in the end, the, you know, if you are putting up this infrastructure, um, does fining you make it go any faster, and does it change your basic approach to it? So, I think those are very valid questions that both sides are going to have to engage with, and I think things are going to have to move very, very quickly if if you are to get this up and running. And you know, as was as well noted, this kind of hybrid custom system is complex and has not been deployed anywhere before. And you know, uh, as always, governments do not have the best track record with putting new systems in place that, that run to time. Yeah, there'd be an IFG report on it somewhere, I'm sure. Um, Maddie, the question on the election and then also around scrutiny. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I think we're all sort of touched on this anyway. Obviously, there is this question about when the Conservative. Uh, party would want an election so there is if they can go into an election having delivered Brexit then that might help them um, particularly against the Brexit party um, I think so there's sort of the po political context of of why it might be better to push through this bill now particularly given that they as I say the majority yesterday was bigger than most people expected so even we don't quite know what amendments might get passed but there's obviously been already some speculation on the panel about whether a second referendum would even get a majority so you might find that actually they will be able to see off the trickiest amendments and therefore why not try and get it through before holding um, an election. I think that sort of will have to be a question for them. I mean, there is also the timing point. So I do think it will be interesting to see what the EU come back with in terms of an extension request. And if, if there's a willingness, whether or not it's a, well, look, we're just going to give you one month and that's it, or whether it's a sort of two-step um, uh, extension proposal, then I think if there is an opportunity that, for example, they could get the UK out of the EU by the end of November with just like a one month sort of extension and they can get the, the Jordan Union bill through then again it might it might be that they uh, politically that Boris Johnson decides that's the best approach so I do think it all comes down to the politics really of the situation um, and we will have to wait and see um, and, and again it will be also about the numbers and what sort of amendments they can see going down um, in terms of whether they can there are really some serious ones that they, they really can't envisage um, happening I mean in terms of in terms of the sort of scrutiny point I do think I do think yeah a lot of people agree that, that the House of Lords are better at getting into the technical detail um, of of uh, legislation I mean I'm going to make one sort of defense of the Commons actually um, is and this sort of comes into the point about having more time and the role committees can play so actually the sifting process that was ended up in the EU withdrawal act around the Henry VIII powers was actually in an amendment proposed by Charles Walker the chair of the procedure committee in the House of Commons because they'd taken evidence around these powers and that was what they, they sort of proposed the establishment of the European Statutory Instruments Committee. Um, now the Lords did actually try and shore up that committee and sort of say that the government would have to follow recommendations from the committee which um, sort of <coughs> amended those provisions and then the Commons rejected it so the Lords sort of stood down so there's you know that, that, will, that sort of thing can happen but I do think again having more time can allow at least some members in the Commons to engage properly with the detail and again particularly allow committees to take evidence which can then be reflected in, in amendments laid. So, but yeah, on the whole, I do think that particularly given the politi political nature and the contentious nature of this uh, piece of legislation, we are likely to see the more detailed um, stuff going on in the House of Lords. Okay, take one here and then John. Thank you, Vicky Price from CUBR. Uh, if there is, as, as I think Raoul was suggesting, uh, the willingness in Boris Johnson to maybe just to get it through, uh, accept some amendments, such as customs union, which I think you mentioned, would he not then have to go back and renegotiate the deal? Uh, and then if he gets it through uh, Parliament, uh, and then of course the EU will be scrutinizing whether we could, whether we're actually following any of this. Um, if then in an election he um, starts reversing this, assuming he wins, um, what will the EU do and what, what, what will where will be the sort of legitimacy of whatever it is that has been agreed? And, and I'm, I'm slightly surprised by this. And then the, the, the question about Theresa May versus Boris Johnson. Uh, I mean, another crucial difference, surely, is the fact that he bought the ERG uh, somehow. Uh, and that, of course, has created quite a lot of concern that he's not be trusted in terms of where he wants to go to in the end, uh, yeah. because in, if indeed he then gets elected, uh, with a majority and reverses everything that's been agreed, everything that's been conceded, uh, then we might end up with a much harder Brexit. Uh, and that, I think, is, is something which businesses certainly are worried about and, and, and look at the process with, with trepidation. So. Thank you very much. John? Uh, yes, uh, John Pete. Um, since 
this institute, like most sensible people, favors evidence-based policy making. Um, I wonder what you think about the Chancellor's point-blank refusal to offer any kind of economic impact assessment of either the deal or the bill. Patrick Lowline from Conservatives for People's Vote. Um, I'd like to point out, it's quite interesting that the deal uh, passed the second reading yesterday, but many uh, MPs only voted to do that in order to prevent no deal. In fact, uh, some did it just to be able to set amendments. What I would like to ask is what you think about uh, Johnson's decision to call a general election. Surely if he calls a general election, he can then, uh, and gets a majority, he can then just repeal any of those amendments because they would be not in the treaty but just domestic legislation. Thank you very much. So, Raphael, I'll come to you on, uh, there's a couple of questions on the kind of status of amendments, one on the customs union and then on what happens following the election. Yeah, so, so Vicky asks if, um, if the bill were amended uh, to get a customs union in, then would Boris Johnson not have to go back to the EU and renegotiate? And I, I think it's extremely important to differentiate between two different kinds of amendment to the bill. One kind of amendment says, we don't like what's currently in the treaty and we want you to renegotiate it. And if that passed, then of course the government would have to go back. But another kind of amendment to the bill, and I think that's the kind of amendment that we're much more likely to see getting traction, says this is what we, what we want you to negotiate as part of the future relationship. So, you know, Her Majesty's government shall be under a duty or it shall be a negotiating objective of Her Majesty's government to enter into a customs union with the EU as part of the future relationship that comes after the transition period. And if that gets into the bill, then, then I mean, in, in, in my view, I don't think uh, Boris Johnson would need to go back and renegotiate at all. Uh, and I think, in fact, there's an interesting point there about selectability. Um, this is a bill to implement a treaty. Uh, and so <coughs> if, there, if, if amendments go down, which do essentially negative the treaty as it currently is, then there's an argument uh, that those amendments <coughs> wouldn't be selectable by the chair, by the speaker, uh, on the basis that they don't implement the treaty, they implement some other treaty or attempt to um, steer the government towards some <coughs> other treaty. Uh, whereas an amendment which tried to uh, control what the government does in the next phase wouldn't do that because it, it, it wouldn't be an attack on the treaty as it currently stands. Um, in terms of the implications of all of that for uh, what would happen after an election, uh, the essential point to make is that, yes, a government with a majority could override any commitments that it made in this phase by passing uh, new legislation. There, I mean, there, there is no way, or at least no straightforward way, of entrenching commitments made by a government now. Parliament is sovereign, and this parliament can't bind its successors. The pre-general election parliament can't bind the post-general election uh, parliament. And so, to some extent, uh, it, 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 it doesn't mean that putting the government under legal obligations in legislation is pointless because that then creates a political hurdle for the government to vault if it wants to go back on what it's promised because it has to repeal that legislation to do so. Uh, and that's not nothing. Um, but in the end, if it's got the numbers, then yes, it can repeal the legislation, it can go back on commitments. Well, on the question about impact assessment and uh, economic analysis, obviously, as John pointed out, the um, Institute is very keen on evidence-based policy making, but if you're in government, would you just say, is it going to change anyone's mind, really, if you were to publish something now? Well, I spent a lot of time working on the previous economic assessment of the, of the previous deal that the government published. Um, you know, there are times where I prefer we wouldn't have had to done it, do it, if, you know, but we did it because it was the right thing to do and because it was, it needed to be done. So, um, look, I, I think it's right, and uh, look, in the end, the the economic assessment that the previous government did is there and it does apply to the sort of agreement that um, the current government is seeking. So I think the evidence is there for everyone to look at. Um, I think I don't agree with the current government in terms of distancing themselves from that um, analysis and that assessment. Yes, it's not perfect. You know, there are things it doesn't consider in terms of the policy response that the government might do and, and the other approaches you might take to, to boost our economy, uh, but that's true of most economic models. It looks at a particular thing about uh, how it moves from the baseline of the status quo of being a member of the EU, and that is a legitimate thing to look at. You can still argue that there are wider political goals and, and wider even economic goals that you might want to look at, um, but this model doesn't take into account. I think, you know, 
there is some sympathy with the government in terms of the absolute nature of our debate now about economic models that uh, that either perfect or completely pointless. No, they, they have use and they provide um, you know what the what the differentiation is from a baseline of the status quo uh, when you change these tariff barriers and, and change this this trading relationship. Um, but they don't pro provide the absolute answer. They're just one part of the debate, and they should be a valid part of that debate. In terms of just coming on to some of Vicky's questions about the customs union, Raphael's exactly right, and I think the Ken Clark Amendment does take the sort of second approach you set out, which is mandating the future um, negotiating aim. Um, I think that doesn't require going back to the EU, and I think if we look, if we remember what happened in March, the EU was actually willing to allow the government to pass just the withdrawal agreement and not the political declaration. So I don't think we should overstate the importance the EU puts on the political declaration. Yes, it, it's there and it's a useful guideline for what the future can be, but actually, even now, it's very broad and there are lots of futures it can envisage. Um, so I don't think they're going to see that as uh, a deal breaker if, if the future approach changes now or even after an election. I think ultimately what will define the future is when both sides set out their mandates. So when the European Council hand down, hands down its mandate for the future negotiations and when you know, the government gets whatever mandate it has signed off by, by Parliament. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think in terms of that, it doesn't, it's not a deal breaker. Just on the, the Boris versus um, Theresa May point in the ERG, yes, you're right, that definitely was a defining point. And I think it's obviously linked to the DUP point because the way that Boris was able to achieve that was by dropping the UK wide customs union um, to allow for the ability to, to, to ensure we can strike free trade agreements for, for Great Britain uh, and obviously involve Northern Ireland via the hybrid customs approach. But that, doing that opened the door to getting the ERG on board while also distancing the DUP uh, and taking a different approach on customs. So the two are sort of, I see them as two sides of the same coin, as I said. Next round of questions. One. Thanks, uh, Chris Morris, BBC. Um, as, as discussed, the bill says relatively little in detail about how the protocol will be implemented, but politically, is it really sustainable as it becomes apparent that almost no political party or business group in Northern Ireland actually thinks it's a good idea? Um, and secondly, perhaps Raphael, what are the implications of this bill more broadly for devolved government? Um, I'd just like to ask about the uh, transition arrangements, because the deadline has remained uh, at the end of December 2020, um, but it's been introduced into the bill that this is now subject to parliamentary ability to extend. How likely do you think we're going to get into permanent extensions of the transition? Okay, so I will come to you first, uh, Raoul, on the protocol and its sustainability. Uh, Maddie, do you want to pick up the devolved administrations and Raphael from the transition? Look, I think it's it's a valid question about about sustainability. I, I've always been of the view that the simple reality is that any approach in the Northern Ireland Protocol will need to have broad consent and broad cross-community consent in Northern Ireland to be sustainable on the ground. I mean, it seems to me an obvious statement, and that's why I think it was always obvious that, that this sort of democratic consent approach needed to be part of it, um, and, and much the frustration, I think, previously that it wasn't. <coughs> I think your question now, I, I guess the question is whether the addition of that democratic consent process um, will help manage this kind of um, frustration, and, um, you know, I guess it can go either way. It depends ultimately whether you feel that, um, you know, it will generate a move from the unionists and the unionist business community to actually think, okay, in the end, this agreement is better than no deal, and therefore they'll move more towards keeping this in place indefinitely, which I guess I think is sort of where the DUP are concerned they will go, or whether actually it will be seen as such a big shift from the status quo for east-west trade that actually businesses, potentially on both sides, but particularly in the unionist community, will just not accept it, just not implement it, uh, and then whether that makes it not sustainable on the ground. So I think at this early stage, it's very hard to say which way that community is going to go, because, you know, I think we do need to see more of the details and I think particularly this, this the stuff that's come up out in the last few days about checks on Northern Ireland to GB trade is, is something that I was personally surprised by. I'm still quizzing government over whether that's actually required because I think if you look at the withdrawal agreement, it makes clear that nothing in there can, can hinder unfettered access for NI goods to GB. It actually allows for the disapplication of EU law that does hinder that access but says you can disapply it as long as it's not there implementing uh, international rules. So the question which needs to be pinned down is, are these exit certificates from Northern Ireland to GB, 
are they required to just by EU law or are they required by international sort of WTO and WCO law? Uh, and that's something that really needs to be cleared up because you know, our view under the previous government was that nothing in, in the protocol as we drafted it, obviously it didn't include the, the customs checks, but um, it would have, would have led to checks on NI or, or requirements of documentation NI to, to GB. So I think that needs to be tested. But there are details that are going to come out, so we don't know which way the community is, is really going to go yet. So it's hard to say. And it comes back to then about the point about enforcement and, and how stringently things are enforced on the ground. You know, again, it's up to the UK authorities to implement this but with oversight from EU authorities and um, ultimately the, the constraints of the withdrawal agreement, the arbitration panel, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it, it, it's very hard to say at this stage which way it will go. Maddie, on devolved administration. Yeah, I mean, so I guess there's, there are sort of uh, two different aspects to this, but sort of on the more general point around uh, the implications for the devolved governments, I mean, I think it's interesting that we've already seen the Scottish government have come out and, and opposed giving consent or sort of recommended to the Scottish Parliament not to give consent to the withdrawal agreement bill. Um, and and the sort of we've seen over the sort of process of Brexit this breakdown in relationship between the devolved administrations and the UK government. I mean around the EU Withdrawal Act it was quite notable that the Welsh government and the Scottish government sort of teamed up in opposition to the UK government in a way that Previously, they haven't necessarily, because the Welsh government has a sort of slightly different relationship with with um, Westminster than uh, the Scottish government. And I think that there's obviously a, a chance that the same thing could happen over the withdrawal agreement bill. And and it is worth saying as well that, you know, last when they did pass the EU withdrawal act, they they passed it against um, sort of the Scottish government or the Scottish Parliament. Sorry, still hadn't given consent to that um, piece of legislation, which was the first time the UK government did legislate in that way. Um, and if they do end up having to do the same thing with the withdrawal agreement bill, I mean, you're going to see the sort of relationship break down much further. Um, and, and there's also the sort of wider point of um, the Scottish government being unhappy about the fact, as they see it, the Northern Irish have the sort of, the Northern Ireland having a different relationship with the EU than the Scottish government have. Um, we've already got the Scottish government pushing hard for a, a, a second independence referendum, and I think that that will only continue um, to, to sort of build. And, and I think there's there's also just one of the things that we've seen um, through this process <coughs> is because of the way uh, that the election in Northern Ireland played out, the 2017 election, um, we've had a sort of lack of nationalist voice in Northern Ireland in Westminster anyway uh, during this process. So we've got the Democratic Unionist Party, and we've also have um, Lady of Sylvia Herman, who's the only independent. Um, Northern Irish MP, and so I think that's also meant that the voices from the nationalist community has not been as present in Westminster throughout this debate. And you know, Storm and Assembly still haven't uh, they haven't resumed sitting yet. That's been over a thousand days, um, and so it's sort of not quite clear how this will play out in terms of um, Northern Irish government if and when we get to the point where 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 the protocol is implemented. Raphael, an extension transition. Will we have permanent transition? So I, I think the uh, the place to start is what the withdrawal agreement says, uh, which is that, so transi transition as it currently stands is set to end at the end of December 2020, uh, but the UK and the EU can jointly decide to extend the transition period. They can do that once only, and they can do it by up to two years, and that decision has to be made by uh, the 1st of July 2020. Now, could it be the case that a couple of years down the line, they've done one extension to transition, and they say, well, we know that the withdrawal agreement said you're only allowed one, but we'd both like, like to do another. Can we jointly agree a new instrument to make sure that we can do another extension? That's probably feasible. It's you know, probably possible in principle to do multiple extensions of transition. But I, I do think that this question of what happens in 2020 in respect of extension of transition is now an extremely important one. At the end of transition, three things can happen. One, you can extend transition. Two, you can move into your new trading arrangement. Or three, you can fall out with no deal. That wouldn't have been possible under the previous government's backstop. It would be possible uh, under the new government's deal. Uh, the, the current bill, the withdrawal agreement bill, makes, it essentially says that falling out with no deal is the default option. And then if you want to go to a deal or go to an extension of transition, Parliament has to vote for that. I, I'm, I'm sure that'll, um, there will be arguments about that uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, over the coming days and weeks, which the def default option uh, should be and what Parliament's role should be in making that decision. But I think when we get to, you know, shortly before July 2020, what we can expect is a repeat of a lot of the arguments that we're having now about what comes next. Uh, one of these options is going to be what the UK wants, uh, and if, if, if it's something other than the, the default, which is, you know, on an international law level falling out, uh, then 
there's going to be a negotiation with the EU over that, and the EU is probably going to say, well, our budget starts in our budget cycle starts in 2021. So if you want an extension, then let's talk about that. We notice that currently your legislative provision is inadequate to make sure you can pay us all our money in any event. So let's talk about that. Uh, any other offensive interests that develop on the part of the EU in the course of the nego negotiation over the next few months, they might try to sort of knock out by giving us what we want um, on transition at that point. You might see another joint report to which it tried, the EU sort of tries to claw back some ground. There's an agreement on fishing due, I think, on the same time that right. the agreement on transition extension is due. So, so, so it's ju it basically becomes a mini, uh, a, a sort of node in the negotiation <coughs> process uh, where a decision is required uh, and at that point whoever has the leverage will use it. I just wanted to add one point on that. I mean there are some on the EU side who argue that once the Article 50 legal base falls away, so once the UK leaves, the ability to rewrite the extension of the transition falls away as well. So there are some on the EU side who argue actually once the UK is out, legally they don't have the power to do multiple extensions anymore. Now, the question about when it really came to crunch, whether that would hold, uh, and you know, it ultimately is an international treaty between two sides, if they decided to rewrite it, I don't see why they couldn't, but there are some on the EU side who make that argument that they wouldn't be actually be legally able to, to give further extensions to the transition at that point. Great, so that is all we have time for. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you feel slightly more informed about the withdrawal agreement bill after an hour of listening to these guys. So if you could help me give them a round of applause and say thank you for our panelists.